Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to today's webinar, The Secure Act Beyond the Hype. My name is Kara McCauley, and I'll be your moderator. So without further ado, I am pleased to introduce today's presenter, Mike Webb, Vice President at Comac Retirement Group. Mike has more than 25 years of experience in the retirement plan industry and is a nationally recognized subject matter expert. Mike, thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Kara. Um, just so everybody's aware, we're going to try to keep the speaking um, portion of the webinar, um, meaning of me speaking, um, to about 40 minutes in length. So we'll have plenty of times for questions at the end for the remaining 20 minutes of the hour. Um, the uh, one thing I want to caution everybody is I'm not an attorney. I don't even play one on TV. So try to keep the questions general in nature. If they're more of a specific fact pattern, the kind of thing that would require legal advice, I'm simply not going to be able to answer it. And I'll politely let you know that I can't. So with that in mind, without further ado, we're going to go right into the SECURE Act. Okay, so to get things started, um, it was signed into law. It's now been in a law, officially law for about a month and a half now. Um, it basically um, breaks a streak, a very long streak we had of about 13 years since PPA was passed, the Pension Protection Act was passed back in 2006, of not having any retirement-specific legislation at all. Now, we have had retirement provisions in, certain, in things like the, the most recent tax bill, but nothing specific about retirement. So that's a very long streak. To give you an idea of what things were like prior to 2006, we would have, um, on average, retirement plan legislation in the 1990s and 2000s pass about every two or three years or so. So really a long drought of retirement-specific legislation that was broken at the end of this year. So the question is now, now that we've broken dam a little bit, um, is SECURE going to live up to the hype? Is it going to be the beginning of another a furious period of activity for retirement plan legislation? Well, I think to get a little bit of the answer to that, we, I think we want to um, take a little bit of a look at how this legislation came about. Um, it was introduced back in March, almost a year ago, um, and just so people are aware, it wasn't introduced as a major piece of retirement plan reform. What had happened was, is since 2006, there's been a lot of um, constituents going to congressmen about various things that are wrong with uh, retirement plans. And this is um, the climate in which the SECURE Act was developed. It wasn't meant, it's, it's more like a fixer-upper kind of legislation than it is to actually change the face of retirement as we know. And we'll talk a little bit about that um, in a moment. Um, so what happened in March? Um, it was just a bill. And I didn't comment on it back then, and neither did a lot of other people, because you know we see retirement bills all the time. Um, there are probably about a dozen retirement-related bills pen, you know, introduced or pending or hung up a committee in Congress right now. Um, so we usually don't get too excited about these things. But then a very weird thing happened. This particular bill passed extremely quickly. Um, two months in, in congressional time is lightning speed for something to pass the House. And not only did it pass the House, it passed the House by a ridiculously uh, bipartisan vote, especially in this partisan environment, something like 417 to 3. Um, so, so that got people excited. I still didn't start writing about it yet because, again, to me, a bill isn't a bill until it becomes law. But there was a lot of excitement. And then, unfortunately, the excitement went away <laughs> um, because nothing happened. After there was talk in May that this might become law by June, that the Senate might pass it and it might become law, but that never happened. And then months passed and nothing really happened with it. And then we had people like Mia going out there saying, well, not only is the SECURE Act not going to pass in 2019, I don't know if it'll ever pass. And we'll have this the long streak of not having retirement legislation uh, will continue. But of course, I was very wrong, as um, to the surprise of definitely me and uh, uh, most most certainly to a lot of other observers out there as well. Um, it got a pass. This um, piece of legislation got attached to a must-pass budget appropriations bill at year end, where and that's that's the way that a lot of legislation does ultimately get passed. Not usually a standalone, but attached to some other legislation that has a lot of you know, a must-pass implications, meaning it has to move like a budget appropriations bill since we're talking about money. So it passed the House December 18th, passed the Senate uh, December 19th, and then became law. So we had a thing, so we started out with a bill that really 
tied up some loose was tying up some loose ends, not designed to be comprehensive legislation, which mm, for a while nobody thought would become law, that all of a sudden became law. So, so uh, now you think, well, there's a big scramble, right? Because uh, you know it passed the year end, and a lot and some of the provisions are effective as early as 2020. But the good news is, is that you know in in the final workup of of the act, um, uh, there's not a lot of stuff that has to be done right away, and there's not a lot of stuff because it was a cleanup bill that's of major major impact. There's not a lot of there's not a lot of things here that are going to change the face of retirement as we know it, and and the most probably the most significant provision, save for one that we'll talk about in in a second, um, are positives for plan sponsors. So a lot of times when you had previously passed legislation, there would be a lot of negatives, a lot of things required a lot in, in, um, of administration, implementation, and cost, along with some positives. This one's pretty much almost all positive. Uh, we're going to go into the good, the bad, and the ugly in a little bit. Um, but I wanted to share a little quote with you from, from the person who started this all, started the legislation, um, was the original sponsor, Richard Neal. Um, when he talks about passage of the bill, we've made significant progress in fixing our nation's retirement crisis. That is Congress speaks for, we've got a lot more, we've done some, but we've got a lot more work to do to fix the retirement crisis. So I would not be shocked if we have a period that was very similar to the late 90s and early 2000s, where we start seeing this is that, that the Secure Act might be just the beginning of some retirement plan legislation that will actually change retirement um, plans as we know it. Um, over the next uh, uh, few years or so. Would not be shocked if that happens. In fact, I would probably bet that that, if I had to make a wager, I would bet that we're gonna see a lot more retirement legislation. We're not gonna see another decade long dead, dead period after the Secure, Secure Act. But of course, I never, I, thought, I never thought the Secure Act would pass in the first place, and at least not in 2019, so I've been wrong before. So we'll see if my, my, my record of being wrong will continue. Okay, so first I wanna talk about the stuff that you've probably been reading tons about already. I'm sure a lot of you have been deluged um, with a lot of information on the SECURE Act. And a lot of it is heavily marketed because there's some people who have certain interest in certain things um, that want to communicate and market those interests to plan sponsors. And that's how things, especially in the social media era, get hyped, whereas some other provisions of the SECURE Act aren't so hyped. And we're going to talk about all of them, but I wanted to talk about the ones you're probably hearing about a lot first, starting with annuities. Uh, this is an extremely annuity friendly bill, um, this legislation that was passed. Um, I'm, I'm sure those who market and sell annuities and mainly insurance companies are, are, are quite thrilled uh, that this legislation was enacted because there, there, there's a lot of significant um, provisions. Um, the, the most significant one is, is that um, a lot of uh, plans, especially 401k plans, a lot of 403b plans, and even some 457b plans have have decent annuity penetration already. But 401k plans uh, have less than 10% annuity penetration now, and uh, um, part of the reason for that is selecting an uh, uh, a annuity prior in in a 401k plan or a retirement plan for that matter. Um, is kind of a cumbersome exercise now. Um, there's a lot of things you have to do, there's a lot of valuations that you have to do. You pretty much have to probably hire hire an, uh, an insurance company expert uh, to do it. And a lot of 401k plans, they don't want, just don't want to bother. Um, the, the safe harbor has been made in the new, I mean, it was a safe harbor before, but it was really, safe harbor implies simplicity and it really wasn't simple. Now you're gonna have a safe harbor and it makes it um, a lot easier for plan sponsors to select a lifetime income annuity provider for the plan. Um, lifetime income projections are going to be on benefit statements. Now, a lot of record keepers have it on their websites already. In fact, when I open my website for my retirement plan, you get a you get a, a projection of what your retirement paycheck will be, and this is what this is basically a, a lifetime income projection um, over the last year. You get that on the very first page of your homepage. But some record keepers don't have it on their statements. There's not going to be a requirement that it's on on people's statements, and you know if 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 people actually read their statements um, uh, and, re and states are showing to retirees or the people who might be in the market for an annuity um, do read their statements more than, than, than individuals who are, who are younger, um, they might be more inclined since it's on their statement to explore, okay, what, what would a retirement paycheck be like in, in the most common way of getting a, a, 
uh, a, retire a paycheck in retirement, if you will, is through an annuity. Um, uh, also, it's going to be one of the other things that it's going to be easier to do, um, that the activated um, easier to do is for participants to um, continue their annuities, even if the plan decides that they no longer want to have an annuity option. So that, that used to be a big deal. If a plan discontinued an annuity option, it was a big deal because the annuity couldn't be real, readily discontinued by the participant without surrender charges or, or, or a lot of other hassle. And it's, they've made it a lot easier for the participants to continue their annuities outside the plan as well. So a lot of annuity-friendly provisions. Um, the, um, the question becomes, uh, did the SECURE Act fix everything that ails annuities? Probably not. Um, the biggest problem with annuities that I see right now are most of them are high cost. There are some low cost exceptions, but most are high cost. Um, the fees aren't transparent, um, so participants don't understand what they're paying for the annuity. And finally, annuities are, are complicated in the first place. So never mind the fees being complicated. It's hard enough to explain exactly what an annuity does to somebody other than saying it's a retirement paycheck. And, you know, there's all the different choices of annuities you have, sing, single life, uh, period certain, term, uh, joint survivor, and, and all these flavors. And having so many flavors, again, serves just to confuse participants. Um, the Secure Act cures none of those things. <laughs> just makes it easy to offer an annuity. And uh, even where annuities are offered, I probably can count on one hand in the last five years the number of participants I've actually seen <laughs> purchase annuities even when they have an annuity benefit offering in their plan. So will participants use them? Probably not, because the, the, the core problems with annuities have yet to be fixed. But I can guarantee you, you will see the insurance company marketing and machine as a plan sponsor. If you don't have annuities now, you're, you're going to be marketed to death on annuities. Um, and I think you have to evaluate them in terms of, okay, have the, have, have the problems that fixed with annuities that make me want to offer in those plan sponsor, and I'll leave that to you plan sponsors uh, out there. The other big thing, PEPs and MEPs, and another new term, by the way, that I just learned the other day called GOPS, or Groups of Plans. So there's actually three acronyms. Um, what are these? Um, they are a special type of plan that basically allows employers to combine interests. So this is mostly for small employers. Your large plan sponsors, you can tune after like the next few, few, few seconds if you're not interested in this. But it basically allows for small employers to band together to try to get a lot of the features that larger plans have. Because they have the, if they band together, their assets make better purchasing power. So things like lower fees, better services, an app, better communication, um, all the things that large plans have. The theory is that pool plans can get together to have them. Now, until this legislation was passed, until the Secure Act was passed, you had to be related to one another or part of be part of a multiple employer plan um, in order to um, in order to band together. Now you can band together if you're a completely unrelated employer. So plumbers can get together with funeral homes, can get together with uh, with tech firms. It doesn't matter now. You can all get together. Uh, you just have to have the same pool plan provider, uh, basically the same record keeper is what probably going to boil down to. Um, in order to to take advantage of this of this pooled of this pooled employer plan, um, MEPs, which existed before the Secure Act, are have also been made a lot easier to um, to utilize as well. Um, there used to be this this silly silly rule called the one bad apple rule that if a bunch of employers got together to form a MEP, and one employer had compliance issues, it would just potentially disqualify the entire MEP, which made absolutely no sense. And the Secure Act just put that to bed and got rid of that. So it's going to be easier to have MEPs. It's also going to be, um, there's also this new other new type of plan in addition to a PEP called the GOP or group of plans, where even if you decide, hey, you know what, um, I don't, I don't, I mean, I want more purchasing power, but a MEPs or PEPs really not for me. I really don't want, I don't really want to give up the flexibility I might have in designing my own plan. Well, with a GOP, as long as you have the same fiduciary, trustee, record keeper, et cetera, uh, and a few other, a few other things together, um, you're going to be able to actually have separate plans, but file one fifty five hundred, um, which means one audit, which is an incredible save, savings of time and resources and money. So that so the GOP's going to be a good a good one, um, you know, that some players want to take advantage of as well. Also, employers, by the way, 
to have multiple plans, a single employer that has like five plans, if they're with the same record keeper, fiduciary, trustee, administrator, they may be able to file 150, 500 for those, for those five plans as well. We're going to, we have to wait. That's one's not starting right away. We have to wait for um, Department of Labor guidance on that one. But uh, that'll be very promising as well. But I've seen a lot of hype for this one as well. PEPs, you know, PEPs are going to change the world of, of retirement as we know it. Well, I, I, I put the brakes on that a little bit. Um, first of all, MEPs, which, which, relate, which involve related employers, have been around a long, long time, and they haven't gained a lot of traction in the marketplace. And there's one primary reason for it. The primary reason for it is they haven't been able to gather enough assets to get that purchasing power. Um, what's happened is only the very smallest employers have banded together to join MEPs. And when, you know, we have the, only the very smallest employers and not a few, like, large, what I call larger small employers get together, um, you don't have the assets. You, you just, you, you need assets. And if you only have the tiniest, you know, the one, the one, two, three employee firms band together, that's still not going to give you a lot of assets. Um, and there's nothing in the SECURE Act that helps that either. So, you know, I, I feel a little more confident that there's going to be more PEPs and MEPs than there are going to be in annuities and 401k plans, for example. But I don't think it's going to be, um, it's going to nearly live up to the hype that, it, that, that PEPs and MEPs have been given. And then we'll find out about groups of plans um, when that, you know, when the 5500 um, regulations come out that address that. So that's the hype. That's the really hype stuff. Let's talk about the stuff that's going to be a little more substance for most people, and we'll talk about the positives first. Um, the biggest one, and I'm so thrilled about this. Back in 1962, someone thought it was a genius idea to commence retirement distributions based on age uh, in, uh, based on age 70 and a half. Congratulations, you're retired. Now you're going to have to remember, not your 70th birthday, not your 75th birthday, but the, the year in which you turn 70 and a half is, is judging how you're going to take your minimum distributions. So, uh, it's, it's almost like somebody like did this to intentionally confuse retirees, and confused they are. One of the biggest planned effects I've seen is a failure to satisfy the minimum distribution requirement. Um, I, I can tell you, it's 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 a it's a disease that affects many plans. Um, a, participants just don't understand the rules. Um, you have missing participants. You have people with smaller balances that probably shouldn't have minimum distributions in the first place since they're so small. Um, and, and all that nonsense. So the good news is, is that at least we're going to buy a little bit more time by making it, making the age 72, which delays it a full year and a half, and also makes it a nice round age that people can remember now. It's going to be, your first distribution is going to be required the later of April 1st, following the, when your 72nd birthday or the year you retire, or the calendar year you retire, if later. So just much simpler. Um, I don't think anybody's going to miss 70 and a half. Uh, I would like to see 75 or even no, or even no required minimum distribution someday. Hopefully future legislation will address that. But at least 72 is a good starting point. The only thing bad about it is they put a silly grandfathering rule in. And I'll get to the 15% cap in a second. But I just want to just give you this last point about minimum distributions. This is the most, probably one of the most key, the most important provisions of the SECURE Act is they put a grandfathering rule in. So if you turn 70 and a half in 2019, meaning you were born on or before July 1st, 1949, remember that date, if you get anything out of this, uh, out of this webinar, 7-1-1949, anybody born 7-1-1949 or before is subject to the old rule. So they're still gonna have to take their 2019 requirement, uh, minimum required distribution by April 1st. And then they're still gonna have to take their 2020 minimum required distribution by December 31st of 2020, even if they haven't turned 72 yet because they're under the old rules. 7-2-1949 um, and going forward, you're under the new rules. So you don't have to, you don't have to uh, worry about that. It's, it's, it's 72 for you. So if someone turns, uh, someone turns uh, 70 and a half, 1-1-2020, we'll just use that as, a, as the uh, first example, they don't have to do anything because they're not going to be 72 until 2021. So no, no, no 2019 distribution, no 2020 distribution. And then they'll have their first one, assuming they're not working anymore, will be April 1st of 2022 will be their 2021 distribution. Um, with me so far, that's why I hate grandfathering because these rules are so complicated. Now you have to explain it. So hopefully you got that explanation. You have any questions again? That's what we use the Q&A for at the end of the session. Um, 
Some other good things that don't apply to everyone. The big one is the 72. Um, there's a bunch of other ones. One is for those of you who have qualified automatic contribution arrangements out there, probably not many of you, but um, I would encourage you to at least look into it. Um, it is probably the best type of automatic contribution arrangement out there. It's one that allows you to avoid ACP and ADP testing for 401k plans and ACP testing for 403D plans completely. So it's a really cool version of the arrangement. It requires an employer contribution, which is why a lot of sponsors balk at it. But if you already have a contribution that satisfies it, uh, the amount requirement, you might want to look into it. Um, a good, a, a big negative of quackas before, what we call quackas, um, was that unfortunately um, they have an auto escalation provision, which is a good provision, which means you don't just start, like you start, you can start at three, generally they start at 3%, we, although we encourage even higher, starting out at five being the default automatic enrollment percentage. Um, but once um, you have to get to at least six under a quacka, and, but optionally you can also let people auto escalate each year up to 10. So you don't have to stop at six, you can go the next year to seven, the next year to eight, the next year to nine, the next year to 10. But then all of a sudden it stops. And that doesn't really make a lot of sense because you think about the time value of money, you want people to be putting more and more money in as they go older and older because that money has less time to grow. So they took the silly rule, which kind of capped out at 10 and increased, I wish they had increased it just whatever the whatever the 42G limit is, but they, they've increased it to 15%. So now you can, have it go to 11 the following year, 12, 13, 14, 15. So good news for, for these types of automatic contribution arrangements. Um, for those of you, um, I mean, most of your retirement plan sponsors out there, but if you have an IRA if you're, or if you're a participant listening, you, there was a silly rule, another silly 70 and a half rule that said you could make contributions to an IRA, which uh, if you were over 70 and a half, which made absolutely zero sense. Remember, we talked about the Secure Act clean, clearing, cleaning up a lot of things that are wrong, a lot of like, these kind of things that almost look like mistakes, <laughs> scrivener's errors, if you will, in retirement plan legislation. And this is one of those where they just clean something up where, you know, something happened made no sense. So now you can make IRA contribution at any age. Um, one, uh, another fairly significant one for those of you who have a variety of retirement plans, um, it's kind of hard to remember the age that in-service distributions may now be permitted, um, may be permitted because they were all different ages. Um, 401k, 403bs, uh, 59 and a half. But governmental 457b plans, for example, um, you couldn't, if you if you wanted to have an in-service distribution provision, you couldn't make it earlier than age 70 and a half. There's that 70 and a half again, and, there, and, and another another place where it absolutely made no sense. And for money purchased to find benefit plans, you couldn't have an in-service distribution provision towards 62. This is all kind of silly. It makes people who sponsor multiple plans more likely to make mistakes when doing distributions because they have to remember all these different ages. So now it's just one age. It's 59 and a half for all plans. So no matter what retirement plan you have, you can allow in-service distributions at age 59 and a half. Now, you can still not allow in-service distributions at all. You can say, this is a retirement plan. We're not going to allow in-service distributions. And you can also say, well, we're not going to allow distributions for employer money, but we'll allow them for voluntary money. Um, you can still do those things, but you just can't have an in-service distribution that's lower than age 59 and a half for that particular for that particular. Um, you know, for that particular plan type, that's an ordinary in-service distribution. Of course, we have other types of distributions um, for heart, for example, for hardship. And of course, you know, plans can also have, you know, employer contributions can be allowed to be distributed distributed for any reason. So you you can you can you can have a reason other than age on on those types of distributions. Um, but the but the good news is, is we'll have some uniformity here on uh, from a plan sponsor perspective. Other good stuff, uh, penalty-free birth adoption distributions. Another, like, like the age 59 half for instant service distributions, another optional rule, not required. So a plan can now feel free. And by the way, this is effective now. This is probably the one, one area where you probably, your plan sponsors out there want to give some thought to this because you can do this right now if you want. You don't even need to amend the plan. You just need to operationally work it out with your provider. You can amend the plan later um, to have uh, this distribution provision. The good news is um, it covers all, all, you know, it's very flexible in covering births and adoptions, but the only thing it doesn't cover is if you want to adopt, say, the um, the uh, stepchild, the stepchild of your spouse, it doesn't cover that, but it covers a lot of other stuff. The bad news is it's only 5,000, so it's kind of limited, especially for adoptions. 
Um, that's not a lot of money for those of you who've been through adoptions. Um, but uh, uh, it is something I don't see a real downside to doing it. Um, there is this little caveat that it can be repaid to the plan. We don't know how that works yet. We have to wait for guidance. So that might be a little caveat, but I, I probably would put it in anyway. Um, you know, I, I, I put this in. People have heard about it and they're going to start requesting it from you. I wouldn't necessarily shy away because the repayment thing, you can always rescind it if the repayment rules become ridiculous. Um, but right now, um, I, you know, it's something that I think plan sponsors should consider um, adopting. And it's, again, another, you know, it's a penalty-free distribution that doesn't mean tax-free. It's just like a, uh, it's just like any other withdrawal. Um, but it is exempt from the 10% uh, premature distribution penalty um, so people can take it out. Um, again, but plan sponsors don't have to adopt it. It's not a requirement. Um, there's been a silly safe harbor notice. For those of you who have safe harbor plans out there, there's always been a, there's been a requirement that you notify people if you use the 3% non-elective to satisfy the safe harbor. Basically, safe harbor, by the way, is another way you can have, avoid testing, like, an, like a quacka. Um, so some few plans out there. Um, it makes sense to notify people when there's a matching plan because they can put money in to get the match. But that really made a lot of sense to tell them, hey, you're getting a 3%. I mean, normally your plan, normal plan communications would handle that anyway, but they added this additional person. In addition to all your, your normal plan communications, you have to do this formal notice requirement for 3% not elected. They, that's been gotten rid of, so that is no more. For all 3D plan sponsors out there who have frozen plans, of which I'm sure there's a lot of you, um, a lot easier to terminate 403 3D plans with the SECURE Act now. Um, it used to be very difficult to, me, to terminate these kind of plans because the participants generally own the assets in the plans, so you can't force them out. Um, unlike a 401k plan, when you terminate a 401k plan, you just force everybody out. Um, 4 3 plans, most of them are in what's called individual annuity contracts, and they're not designed that way. Now, um, this clears up a little loophole. Um, if you had annuities, it was you know you could terminate a, a 4 3 plan because you could continue you could continue that contract outside the plan. It would be, be called distributed in kind. So the participant could continue it outside the plan and you'd still, the plan would still be considered terminated, but that rule didn't apply to mutual funds. So this clears up that loophole and allows that rule to apply to mutual funds as well. So um, hopefully there'll be more 403 plan terminations because there's a lot of dead 403 plans out there that probably should be best terminated. Um, Non-discrimination testing requirements for DB plans. Um, for those of you who don't have DB plans, you can feel free to uh, tune out for the next few seconds, but I'll keep that very quick. Um, we're gonna have, um, um, we, we have a kind of a catch-22 in defined benefit plan sponsors. As you know, a lot of defined benefit plan sponsors over the year have terminated their plans. Um, they just can't afford them anymore. And um, that terminating is pretty harsh because you just, you get rid of the benefits for everybody. Um, basically, um, but uh, and and hard freezing. What's called hard freezing is is tough too because then you freeze all the accruals for everybody. Um, they still get benefits, but they don't get any more accruals. So to have a soft landing for people, especially older, longer service employees who you know are the most have the most to lose when you terminate a benefit plan, a defined benefit plan. Um, they they did a hard, a hard a, you know people figured out. Hey, we'll just do a, what's called a soft freeze. We'll allow the older, longer service employees to continue to accrue benefits, but the new participants, they'll have to go into a defined contribution plan and we're not, we're not giving a benefit to them. The problem is that doesn't work with testing. Um, what happens is, is that those older, longer service employees tend to be highly compensated and if you give them a benefit, a generous benefit, and don't give that same generous benefit to the non highly comps, you tend not to pass testing. So the SECURE Act sticks that so that um, plan sponsors have this in their arsenal because if they don't have this in their arsenal, they're actually steered more to terminating, to freezing, the, hard freezing the plan or terminating the plan when, you know, a soft freeze would be much more palatable to participants. So it's nice that the SECURE Act came up with this provision. Um, other, another very, very good thing we talked about already was the GOP, the group of plans. Um, it plans with the same record keeping trustee, trustee fiduciaries, plan year investments. Um, beginning in, when, um, in 2022, they're gonna have a combined 5500 filing and obviously do all tell us how that how that works. And that'll be great for the, especially for your single employers out there who have multiple plans. Hopefully that'll be a great way to just have one 5,500 filing. Um, startup plans, if you're a really small plan out there, um, it, small businesses are going to be, have a much bigger incentive to startup plans. Uh, there used to be a subsidy, of a tax credit of $500. Now it's 
5,000. <laughs> so um, a much, you know, tenfold increase. And then if you use auto enrollment, you get a $500 bonus for three years. So really, um, it's $500, another credit, bonus credit for three years. So very, very favorable for small employers, trying to encourage them, because as you know, most of the lack of retirement plan coverage in this country is at very small employers, not large ones. Almost all large employers have retirement plans. Um, retroactive adoption of, of new retirement plans permitted. And you may say, well, why would someone want to enact retroactively uh, adopt a, a, a retirement plan? Well, what, what happens is, is that usually this mistake occurs by accident. They've adopted their 401A plan, but they actually didn't sign the document. They had an all beautiful document already, but they didn't sign it by the end of the year. So now that they can be disqualified because now they have an invalid plan. So this allows that, that, that to be fixed to having retroactive adoption in the following year up to the filing deadline for tax return. It only works for 401A plans because if you have an elective throw plan like a B or K, that hat plan has to be in writing, meaning it has to be executed before deferrals can be made. So um, another cool, cool perk of the secure plans for safe harbor, probably encourage more safe harbor plans out there, is that um, the, the problem with safe harbor plans is they're they're put in so you could pass so you don't have to pass ADP ACP testing. Well, a lot of times you don't know if you're going to pass ADP ACP testing until very late in the year or even after the year's over. So you're kind of putting in a plan based on a guess. So this eliminates a little bit of the guesswork of having to be having to be Kreskin, if you will, um, uh, to predict the future to put in a safe harbor plan. It'll actually allow you to to look at your test and say at the year, end of the year and say hey, it looks like my test is going to fail, so let's put in the safe harbor contribution, and I could do it as late as 30 days prior to the end of the plan year. And if I want to bump up the contribution to 4%, if uh, I can even wait until the year end result and the actual ADP ACP is run at the end of the year, I see that that's failed, boom, my solution is put in a safe harbor plan, increase the contribution to 4 and we go along. The, the only catch to this is you can't do it with matching contributions. That only has to, you can only do it with that non-elective contribution. So it does cost a little more money to do this. What's the bad of Secure Act? The good news is there's not that much bad at all, um, as we talked about at the outset. Um, the biggest bad thing is going to be for 401k plans. Um, 401k plans, unlike 403b plans, um, and, uh, and where you have this universal availability, which basically everybody is allowed to make elected deferrals, or 457b plans, where you can you generally pick and choose the, uh, the employees that can make elected deferrals. Um, in a tax exempt, you have to limit them to a top hack route of select management, highly compensated. Um, 401k plans operate differently. You can basically exclude part, um, you can basically exclude um, um, employees who have, haven't hit the service hours of the requirement of the plan, generally a year in which they work a thousand hours, from the right to make elected deferrals. So long term part time employees, often you can keep them out of the plan from making elected deferrals forever. Um, I'm not going to allow this anymore. So beginning in 2024, if someone worked 500 hours, um, at least 599,999, uh, in 2021, 2022, 2023 has to be three consecutive years, they're going to have to be allowed to make elective deferrals. Well, that's a big deal for 401k plans because 401k plans are going to have to count hours for these part-timers. Uh, for some, for some, it's just, hey, some systems don't even have part-timers set up hour on, uh, to, to do that. So it's going to be a, a big, big bear. Um, fortunately, it doesn't it isn't effective until 2024, but it's going to be, you have to start counting hours in 2021. So it, it's going to be a huge deal. I think what's going to happen is a lot of 401k plan sponsors are not going to count hours for these folks, and they're just going to let everybody into the plan. It doesn't cost them anything because it's only elective deferrals, not employer contributions. Um, so I think the, the reality is we're going to see um, – 401k plans become more like 403 plans where we generally allow everybody to make the right to participate. I think they're going to let these long-term part-timers in. Um, some of you might have heard of the stretch IRA provisions. Um, it's really a misnomer. It's not a stretch IRA. It's really a stretch provision for retirement plans as well. So it just, should just be called the stretch retirement provision. Um, it's basically a provision that allows people who have large retirement account balances um, not to burden their beneficiaries with uh, the taxes by spreading them out um, in a lot of cases over the lifetimes of very young beneficiaries. Well, to, to do a lot of things in the SECURE Act, um, like raising the minimum required distribution age, which costs money, costs revenue, 
Um, they had offset that um, that expense somehow, and what they decide to do is basically gut the stretch IR provision. If you've never heard of the stretch IR provision before, then you probably don't care. But if you if you um, um, if you've recognized it as a tool for maybe some of your C-suite employees to stretch out their who aren't necessarily going to take their retirement plan money and want to leave as much of their beneficiaries as possible to stretch out the tax burden, well, they're going to have a lot less flexibility to do that. Um, basically, it's restricted now to 10 years instead of lifetime. There are exceptions for spouses, uh, minor children, but then the, for the, just you know, the clock for minor children starts when they're eight, when they become um, when they become um, adults. So it's not it's not spread out over a minor child lifetime. Um, so there's a lot less flexibility here. A lot of people have said the stretch IRA provision or the stretch provision is essentially dead. Um, but like I said, you haven't heard of it, about it before. Um, probably isn't going to matter now. So hey, that's it for the bad. Isn't that great? <laughs> um, actually, there was one more, and there's the ugly. And most of you probably don't have to worry about this because you're not late. In I'm hoping out there uh, that you're not late in filing your 5500s or your 8955 SSA. But if you do, uh, if you are late, boy, the boom has been lowered. Um, there's a DOL penalty that's pretty high already, but now the IRS penalty is going to be increased tenfold. So um, a late filing uh, is going to go up ten times to from the old twenty-five dollar penalty to two hundred and fifty dollars a day. Uh, the the um, A nine fifty five SSA for those of you who don't know what that is, you should be filing it, so you should know if you're a plan sponsor. That's a Social Security the form you report people who terminate it but haven't taken a, benefit, a, a distribution out of plan yet. It goes to Social Security, has to be filed, same deadline as the 5500 every year. That's going to go up. That's going to go up tenfold as well. By the way, the, the penalties, the caps for the penalties too are going to go up. So that 25 to 250 per day. The old cap was 15,000 um, per year. That's going up to 150,000. Um, so really, um, really draconian penalties here. Um, almost as bad as the 50% minimum distribution penalty, which is draconian. These are going to be, get very draconian as well. It's going to be very expensive to do this. So be on time with your forms. And your withholding notices. They're, they're primarily, most plans, your record keeper's responsibility, but you want to check with your record keeper to make sure that they provide those withholding notices on time. Those are, those are in advance of, um, of uh, distributions that tell people they're withholding, they're withholding and rollover options. So you want to make sure that those get uh, sent out as well because the penalty for that is increased tenfold. Not going to talk much about the rest. Um, most of it doesn't. Most of it does. In fact, we talked about the, uh, the fact that you can take new annuity income options already. These are a lot. Of these are smaller provisions um, of the act. Um, disaster related transactions are already treated very favorably, but there's going to be. It's going to continue on distributions up through uh, February of 2020, from eight, 2018 till now, uh, till now. Where you can, there's a waiver of the 10% penalty, uh, an increase in the, the dollar amount of loan limit up to $100,000. Again, uh, not, you know, most plans don't have a lot of disaster related, uh, thankfully don't have a lot of disaster usually distributions, so not much of an issue. Um, I'm not going to really talk about the church plan one. Church plans are, have been under that understanding already. It's just been actually put in an act uh, that you can, retirement income accounts uh, can cover them. Uh, cover employees of tax expense controlled by the church. Uh, so basically just um, making law what church plans understood anyway. Um, uh, there's another helpful thing for MEPS, if there's less than a thousand participants uh, in a MEPS, they can do a short form and avoid a costly audit, which you know, if you have small employees banding together, an audit can be very costly. So that's that's a wonderful provision. Um, you can read some of these on your own. I'm again, not gonna go through all of them. Um, the credit card one is very interesting. I don't think I've ever seen a plan for him, uh, allowed to make loans through a credit, credit card or similar arrangements, but now you can't do it anymore. So, um, and you can see there's a few other ones. Um, you don't have to memorize all these little things I'm putting on the screen. Um, uh, we have in the uh, handout section, um, and we have a handy dandy chart that has all these provisions in it. Um, I'm going to get to questions because we're right at the 40 minute mark, uh, but just what have we learned today um, in a nutshell? Not a lot of media plan sponsor action except on that birth adoption. I think you, what they call, actually, the acronym for that, by the way, is QBAD, the Qualified Birth for Adoption Distribution. So you want to act on that one, work with your egg keep on that one right away if you can allow it. Um, a remedial amendment period, uh, this is another reason why little, plans, little media plan sponsor action is required. 
Amendments are not going to be until 2022, later for certain types of plans. And we talked about not not all being good news with the 5,500 penalties uh, and the thing and the 401k plans having the big deal about part-time uh, employees. Um, whether we're going to remember the Secure Act 10 years from now, uh, I don't know. Um, I'm going to guess not, um, but I suspect this is going to open the dam for a lot of pieces of retirement legislation that we will remember. And you small plan sponsors out there, you're definitely going to want to explore. Even though it's very hyped, um, there is some substance to it. Explore PEPs or MEPs as a way to improve your collective purchasing power. As we said, in the handouts, uh, we have more information. I hope that we have, um, we have we have that chart there. I hope we have a lot of questions. And I guess Kara McCauley is going to tell me right now if we do have a lot of questions. And if we if we if we don't, that's fine as well. We'll end early, but. Um, we're going to stay here um, to take the questions that uh, hopefully we, uh, you, the audience, has for us. Yes. Thank you, Mike, so much for this exceptional overview of the Secure Act. Just a reminder that if you did want to submit a question, you do still have time, and you can do that through the questions tab. Um, I do have some here for you, Mike, so I'm going to get started. Our first question is, is the in-service childbirth distribution feature definitely optional? Yes, definitely optional. It again, you, if you if you type in Google Secure Act and text, and actually if you want to read the Secure Act, there's a nice little clickable text version of it where you can click on the link to that section, and it is absolutely optional. You are not required to offer distributions for um, for births or adoptions. Having said that, Kara, I think there's going to be demand for it. I think people are going to want it. So, um, you know, you could you could certainly explain to an employee who wants to do it that you know you don't have to offer it. But I don't see much of a downside to offering except this repayment part, which, you know, you can always we can always mend it. If the repayment proves to be a burden um, later on, you can always amend it to remove it from the plan. Um, but I, I don't see much of a downside to offering it, but 100 um, percent not a requirement for plans to offer qualify the QBAT or qualify for or just option uh, or adoption distribution. Um, it is completely optional. Okay, great, thank you. Um, the next question is, if a plan does not allow for in-service distributions, will they still be able to take advantage of the birth and adoption distribution? Correct, different, different, part, of the, different part of the law. Um, so it, they can, they, I, I can amend my plan to say I, that I prohibit in-service distributions except for um, qualified birth or adoption. And that's perfectly legal. Right now we have plans that prohibit in-service distributions except in the case of hardship. Um, we've seen plans designed that way. Um, and that's perfectly legal. So certainly, yes, you can absolutely say, you know, I don't want, and, and you're not tied to one or the other. You don't have to say, you don't have to offer hardship if you're if you're offering QBAT or the other way around. So, and, and QBAT's not a hardship distribution. It's a, it's a penalty-free, it's a penalty-free distribution category of its own. So it has nothing to do with the nothing to do with the hardship rule. Okay, excellent. Next question is how will the repayment to the plan of qualified birth or adoption distributions work? <laughs> we don't, that's a good that's a good answer. How about I don't know? How's that for an answer, huh? Let's give let's give me a round of applause for that one. That's that that, that took a lot of thought. Um the reason we don't know is um that's subject to guidance that is yet to be issued by Treasury. So we're going to find out the answer to that. So we don't know. So that's the only potential downside right now. If those rules tend not to be particularly burdensome. Um, plan sponsors may be like, what did I just get into by allowing these qualified birth for adoption distributions? <laughs> um, but I don't think they're going to be. I mean, the whole idea was Congress passed this for a reason. Why would the IRS make it, might make it impossible to do the repayments? Um, the way I think the payments might work, and this is total conjecture, is um, is that they'll allow people to repay them at any time, and they'll, but they'll have to repay them within a certain time frame in order for the, the repayment to be considered um, to cancel out the taxation of the prior distribution. Because remember, they're not subject they're not subject to the penalty, but they're subject to income. Um, so they're so they're taxed on what they take out. They just have to pay the extra ten percent. So in order to negate that tax, that's how you, the only reason you repay it is to negate the tax. I think you're going to have to repay it in a certain you know, you would think that they're not going to allow people to like take a distribution in 2000 and then in 2020 you repay it and then all of a, then go back and 
go back and be able to redo their 2000, I don't even know if that's possible, 2020 tax return um, 20 years later to give them more, you know, to give them more tax, less taxable income. So I think there's going to be some, you know, some logistics that do I think it's going to be a game changer um, for plant sponsors who have already added that provision? No, um, but we don't know. The answer is we don't know. Okay, thank you. Um, the next question is, do plan sponsors have to do anything in regards to the stretch IRA provision? No, it's, um, what's going to happen is, is that the way, if you have rules in your plan regarding um, the ability to stretch out, stretch out payments, which you, which, which you, if you have an annuity, if you have, if you have um, annuity survivor provisions in your plan, this policy come into play. You, when, 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 in 2022, when they do the next round of amendments to your plan, they'll, they'll, change that, they'll change that language. Some plans aren't that specific. They just default to whatever the, the code says. But if there's specific present, if there's specific provisions in there to talk about um, the, uh, the, the taxation of distribution, then those will, then if you're on a prototype, your record keeper will take care of that amendment. If you're if you're on a individually designed plan, you document your attorney would presumably take care of that. But I suspect beyond a, beyond possibly some plans having to do some changed language, not really expecting it um, to be an issue. Now, for the for the, the sweet employee or the high high account balance person who's taking advantage of this provision, uh, they're going to be a little disappointed. But I'm, I'm sure their accountant will will, uh, will spring the bad news on them that they're not going to be able to spread out this distribution uh, taxation. So. Okay. Um, our next question says, our non-governmental 457B plan does not allow in-service distributions. This is allowed. Can we amend our non-governmental plan to allow for age 59 and a half in-service withdrawals? Is this permitted? No. It's, it, I, that's why I specifically said in the slide, governmental 457 plans have this in-service distribution rule. The way deferred compensation works in these 457B plans of of private tax exempts is you basically they're basically true deferred compensation plans, meaning you can you defer the compensation until you leave, and then you get the compensation. So you, you, you generally, if you have a right to take it in service, an argument can be made that you're taxed on it when you have the right to take it in service, even though you're not taking it while you're in service. So no, those plans are still going to be the same way that they've always been written, where the money. You take the money when you leave. You take the money when you leave, except for um, unforeseeable emergencies, which is the only exception um, to such plans um, that you can make distributions on. Now, no, unfortunately, I'm sure the the questioner wanted a different answer than the one I gave. But no, those plans are still those private tax exempt 457B plans are still subject to the um, the rules that you that are generally less flexible with respect to distributions, and you can't roll over distributions in those kind of plans either. So that's another another disadvantage of those kind of plans. Okay, um, thank you. And the next question is, the special catch-up does not allow someone age 70 and a half to participate with this automatically change. Will this automatically change to 72 with the new RMD age? The special catch-up, hmm. There's only, did, did, did they say what kind of catch-up? Maybe they can do a follow-up question because the only catch-ups I'm aware of if they're talking about catch-up contributions are the age 50 catch-up, which, it doesn't stop at age doesn't stop at age seventy and a half, and the special fifteen year catch up for 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 four hundred three B plans, which also doesn't stop at age seventy and a half. So I'm not I'm not sure what catch up they're referring to, but neither of them stop at age seventy and a half. So the the, the minimum distribution seventy and a half rule would not apply. Am I missing something in the question, Kara? Um, I don't think so. If the if the person who asked that question wants to send a follow up, we can address that as well. Okay. All right. Um, the next question is, um, does the new ruling on RMDs apply to active employees? No. The good thing about the new rules is that they, they, they change the they, – they stay the same except you substitute age 72 for 70 and a half. So that's a very, very good question. If I'm age 80 now and I'm still working, I don't have to take them in required distribution. And Secure Act did not change that. It's only when I'm, you know – under 70, I'm under 72 now, and I'm no longer working, 
that that new rule helps me because now I it's 72 instead of 70 and a half. But if I'm still working, um, I the, the rule's not that part of the rule isn't relevant to me because I won't have to take distributions until I actually stop working. So that's a very 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 important distinction everybody should be aware of out there that the 72 only applies to people who stopped working. If you're, if you're 70, 72, 73, 74, 75, 90, 80, 90, 100, um, and you're still working, you, you don't have to take minimum required distributions. Now, keep in mind, even though the IRS recently made the tables um, more favorable in terms of mortality, meaning you have to take a little less out at age 72 um, than you would have before, um, if you delay them to like 90, for example, and you retire after, after 90, you're going to have to take more money at that point. I think I think you'll be understanding of that. I think you'll want to take probably all your money at that point if you're fortunate enough to work until that point. Um, but you know, obviously, your 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 life expectancy obviously is shorter. So so obviously, your minimum distribution. The later you retire, the larger the minimum distribution is going to be. Uh, the annual amount is going to be when you do retire. Any more questions, Kara? Well, I hope I have everything else, uh, everybody else out there. I don't. I think we actually lost Kara. Um, but uh, oops, I'm sorry, Mike. Um, yes, nope. we do have quite a few more questions. I don't want okay. you, Kara. Don't don't, be, don't worry me like that. <laughs> <laughs> I apologize. All right. So the next question is: When do plan sponsors have to update their plan documents by to comply with the Secure Act? Oh, okay. Yeah, that's actually in one of the slides. Um, the good news is um, not until at least 2022, and who knows, before 2022 rolls along, maybe they'll delay it further. So not for a while, and that includes 4.3e plans, by the way. I know all of you are scrambling. Well, hopefully you're not scrambling by now. Hopefully you've done it uh, to to restate your plans um, uh, onto a prototype or update your individual design plans to meet the March 31st deadline. The good news is you won't you won't have to now amend things like for minimum distribution requirements by March 31st. Those amendments are not don't have to be done until until 2022. So very good question there. People can relax. They don't have to panic and amend their plans right away. Okay, great. Uh, next question. Please discuss the 10-year limit for non-spouse distributions. It basically means that you can only stretch the tax burden. So if you if you if you die. Normally, um, under the old rules, you could have stretched out the, your beneficiary. You could have, let's just say, I could have named any minor beneficiary. Let's say I'll name somebody who's, uh, I, I, well, we'll make it easy. I'll, I'll name my, I don't know, uh, um, I'll, I'll name a grandchild or whatever as a beneficiary. The old rules allowed certain, um, for certain beneficiaries, allowed stretching out of, um, the payments over the beneficiary's lifetime. So if I chose a really young beneficiary, we'll just say we'll just say we'll, let's make it a easy make just make it a child because that's a little easier to explain. I could stretch out the required payments from the account over it once upon my death over that child's lifetime. So the payment so the tax burden for that child would be much smaller. Now the rule is going to be, for example, if I have a child, if I name a minor child, for example, that once that child is the, is 21 there, I'm only going to be able to stretch that distribution, those required distributions out over 10 years. So there, if I have a, you know, and for most people, this doesn't matter. But if I have $2 million in my retirement account, that's a lot of a big taxes that that person is going to take because they have to take at least, you know, you know, at least $200,000 of that out each year and be taxed on that money. Because remember, beneficiaries are always taxed on money um, when they get it out from a retirement plan, unless it's Roth. Um, so... Um, so we're talking about, uh, you know, this only affects just, you know, people have very, very large account balances. So most people don't have to worry about this. And it was a provision. It was basically a provision that allowed this burden to be stretched out that no longer exists. Now, it still exists for certain people. Spouses can still do lifetime and all the exceptions that we list. And by the way, they're in they're, they're, they're in our presentation, but they're also in the, the supplemental materials we have um, in our chart as well. Um, but that's that's the way it works. It was a, ba it was a way to spread out the tax burden that um, no longer exists now with the Secure Act um, for certain beneficiaries. Still exists for for spouses and other types, but 
um, doesn't have nearly as much flexibility as it as it once did. But if you hadn't heard of this provision before, chances are you're probably not going to hear about it now, uh, even though the Secure Act is passed. Okay. Um, the next question is: Our 457B plan currently allows for the in-service distribution at age 70 and a half. I wanted to confirm that we can leave this be at age 70 and a half. Correct. Correct. You don't have to. You don't have to. Remember, it's optional. So you don't have to. You don't have to reduce it to 59 and a half, but you can. So that's uh, so that's the difference. It's just that it used to be that you couldn't. That same plan, if they wanted to reduce it below 70 and a half before, couldn't. Did not have that as an option, so they can still leave it seventy and a half. I'm not as 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 you probably become painfully aware throughout this uh, webinar. I am not a fan of the seventy and a half of making people have to remember when did they turn seventy and a half. Um, you know, I mean, I'm 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 uh, I'm fifty one, and I would take a, I would take a few moments to figure out when I turned fifty. 50 and a half. So and that's just and that wasn't a, that long ago. So I you know I'm still not a fan of 50, of 50 but but you know obviously if you can you can if you can make that argument 59 and a half as well. But uh but you can yeah you can change it to any age you can change it to 65 as long as it's not below 59 and a half or you could leave it at 70 and a half. So you do have that flexibility to answer that question. Okay, great. Um the next question is, for which plan year is the new penalty for late filing of 5500 and SSA is effective? Um, I have to, ch if you give me just a moment to check on that, it actually is, it actually is in our chart. Um, I think it's effective for the, the next filing, yeah. So not the ones, obviously, they don't make it retroactively effective. So the ones, for the ones that most people have to file in July or October if they extend, Meaning the 2019 filing, it wouldn't be effective for those. It would be effective for the the first effective for the 2000 filing or any plan year after, um, or any filing. Oh, you know what? No, I'm wrong on that. Actually, any filing due after 12 31 2019. So scratch that. Um, it would be actually effective for the 2000. It actually is grandfathered in a way if you look at it. It would actually be uh, effective for the 2020. Yeah, I think it's getting to that time of the webinar. <laughs> But it is effective with the 2019 filing that's due in 2020. So it's in, essentially immediately effective. So don't be late. The, the bottom line is don't be late with your 5500 filing. Don't be late when you're a United 55 SSA filing. Okay. And just to be aware of the time, we are coming up to the, the end of the webinar. We do still have some questions left. So if you do want to hang on, we'll, we'll continue answering them for the next few minutes. And again, if you think of a question after the webinar has concluded that you would like us to answer, please do feel free to reach out at info at comacretirement.com or via social media um, on our LinkedIn page or our Twitter account. So the next question, Mike, um, is if we have a Social Security replacement plan for our part-time employees, will we be required to allow the 401k um, long-term part-time for our long-term part-time employees? If you do not have a 401k plan now that does, that, that if you already have a 401k plan that permits part-time employees to participate, then you will, then you don't have any issues because you're only allowing them. A Social Security replacement plan, I'm not really all that familiar with that. I think it's a 401A plan. Um, so if you're not allowing employees now to make elective deferrals, part-time long-service employees, to make elective deferrals to a 401K plan, then you will have to do so. It doesn't matter whether you have a Social Security replacement plan or any other type of plan. Um, I mean, the only exception probably would be when you have to wait till the guidance comes out. I'm pretty sure an exception would be if you have a 401k plan and a 403b plan, for example, and you allow those long those employees to make deferrals to the 403b plan, I think that would probably be a once we see regulations on this, that would probably be an exception because it's an exception right now in 403 to the 403b universal availability rule. So it, it would and it would make logical sense uh, and be exception to the 401 to the 401k rule. Um, but uh, but but if you're not allowing them to make elective deferrals to a 401k or presumably 403b plan then you're going to have to allow them and other other types of plans that don't allow pre-tax elective deferrals are not going to make a difference. Okay. And Mike, the, um, the, the person who asked this question just did reply and said that their Social Security replacement plan is actually a 457B plan. 
a 457B plan. Um, that's, that's interesting. I guess the question would be is, is, is that a private 457B plan that's limited to select management and highly compensated? If that is the case, then they will, they will indeed have to allow uh, elective deferrals to be made to a, to a 401k plan. If it's a government LL 457B plan and you're allowing everybody in, uh, I guess you'd have to wait and see what the guidance, uh, guidance says on that. Um, again, these rules aren't going to be effective until, you know, you're not even going to start counting hours to 2021 and they're not going to be fully effective to 2024. So I'm sure there's going to be reams of guidance, um, from, from the, from the tre treasury on this, um, and how this actually comes into play in practice. But I would say, I mean, I would guess if you all allowed them an elective deferral opportunity, in other words, you're allowing an opportunity to make pre-tax elective deferral to a qualified retirement plan, meaning governmental 457, uh, 403B, 401k, that, 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 uh, you won't have to, you won't have to additionally allow them to make deferrals to a 401k that they're probably not a part of in the first place. They're probably part of one of those other plans. Um, so that would be my answer on that. Um, but again, we're not, I'm not sure, not, certain of that because we'll have to see the guidance issue. What we do know is, is that you're going to allow, have to allow them to make an elective deferral to the 401k plan. Um, and if, if the 403B and 457B might be a substitute for that, but if you don't have any other plans, you're definitely going to have to allow them to make an elective for a 401k plan. Uh, that even means if you're giving them some employer contributions of other plans, that's not an elective deferral. So that one count. Okay. And we do have a few more questions if you want to hang in there. Um, the oh, next one is what? I, I, I can answer, uh, I can answer secure act questions literally all day. I, I suspect our audience <laughs> will be doing it, but. <laughs> all right. Well, we have a couple more, so we'll, we'll get through these ones. Um, and then again, a reminder that if you come up with questions following the webinar, please do submit them to us. Um, the next question is what should plan sponsors know about restating their plan as part of a retirement plan transition? Uh, restating their plan as part of a retirement plan transition in general. Um, um, well, for four or three plans, they better restate their plan by March 31st. Uh, for K plans, um, you know, you, you can make discretionary, you know, you make discretionary amendments, meaning amendments that don't change with the tax law. You want to do them in a timely fashion. You generally want to do them before the, before they're even, you know, even effective. Um, but for the legal requirement amendments, meaning the ones under the Secure Act, you're going to, there's going to be a, a very, a restatement process very similar to the remedial amendment periods we have now. So I don't, I don't think that's going to really mess up anything. Um, you're, it's going to be, you, there's going to be guidance. It's going to be very clear as to when you have to amend your plan. There's no amendments here for secure until 2022 at the very earliest. So I don't think, I don't think a retirement plan, doing a retirement plan transition now, I don't, I don't know quite what that means, but maybe changing record keepers, changing plan design. Um, you'd still amend your plan to do a discretionary amendments in the same plan. Now, you, I, you might want to kill two birds with one stone and amend your plan for the Secure Act requirements. The problem with that, though, is we don't. We there's going to be got, a lot of this is dependent on guidance. So you may go ahead and put Secure Act amendments in, like for example, for qualified birth for adoption. We don't know what the repayment provisions are yet, so you might have to rewrite that amendment um, to include the repayment provisions. So I probably, if you were doing transition, I'd probably just stick to the discretionary amendments and not the legally required ones under the Secure Act for now until we get more guidance and wait until, you know, the 2022 rolls around to do those amendments. Okay, great. And then this is going to be our last, our last question for today. Um, does the long-term part-time rule apply to defined contribution 401A plans or only 401K? Only 401K plans. Um, doesn't apply to 403B. It applies to it only applies to the elective deferral piece. So employer contributions are not involved with this. Just so everybody's aware, if you have a 401k and you're pairing it with a 401a profit sharing, for example, um, you don't have to give the part time as the profit sharing. You only have to allow them the right to contribute to the 401k. So and and the reason it only applies to 401k plans is 403b plans have their own rules already, and 457b plans have their own rules already for for L, for that for elective deferral eligibility. Um, so they don't need these new rules. Part um, they, for the reference, for example, long term part timers are already allowed to defer for the most part. So, but um, clear, no, doesn't apply to any 401a, any any employer, any employer contributed benefit at all. You're not going to have to. This is not going to be a budget item. This is going to be just allowing them the right to make elective, such employees the right to make elective deferrals. 
Will it have consequences? Yeah, because these employees tend to have smaller balances, which will drag your average account balance down, which might increase your pricing. So there is some consequence to it, but not not that direct budget hit that an employer, you're not having to make an employer contribution for these employees, unless you want to, but you don't have to under the new Secure Act rule. Okay. Mike, thank you again, um, and thank you to our audience for listening today. If you would like additional information on the SECURE Act, uh, please contact your CAMAC Retirement Group consultant, or you can email us again at info at CAMACretirement.com. We encourage you to stay up to date with this and all the other important retirement plan topics by visiting our Knowledge Center on our website at CAMACretirement.com. Thank you again, and we hope you enjoyed today's webinar.